All right, we're gonna move on to Dr. Aaron Green, who I won't reintroduce uh, as known well, but I will say he was my introduction to lymphedema when I was a, a vascular medicine fellow and uh, really a pleasure to continue to learn from him today. Thanks, Dr. Green. Thank you, Brett. All right, so I'm gonna be talking about obesity-induced lymphedema, and there were actually some questions after uh, my first talk on primary lymphedema related to this subject. So obese, the relationship between obesity and lymphedema is well known. So for many, many years, uh, it's well recognized that lymphedema is the number one uh, variable that dictates uh, someone's risk for getting lymphedema after lymphadenectomy, radiation, et cetera. As I showed in the previous talk and here, the number one variable that affects how people do with lymphedema is their weight. And so here's someone with a BMI of 23, same BMI seven years later, no progression of her lymphedema. And then here's the opposite, someone who presented to our center for the first time with a BMI of 43, two years later, you can see what happened. And so uh, during this talk, I'm gonna uh, focus on the fact that independently, obesity can actually cause secondary lymphedema. And so we made this observation about 10 years ago now. Um, this was a patient that came into the center she said to me that she had lymphedema. At the time, I thought she just had obesity and kind of just to, to determine what was going on, this was the first obese patient I ever ordered a lymphocinogram on. And then to my surprise, she had no other risk factors for lymphedema, secondary lymphedema, or primary lymphedema, et cetera. She was normal weight at age 18 and then just uh, steadily gained weight over her life. And I was very surprised to see that she had lymphedema. So because of this patient, uh, from then on, any patient that came to our center that had obesity, the, the government defines as a BMI over 30, I obtained a lymphocinogram on. And then what we found uh, was that we published in New England Journal of Medicine that all patients that uh, had a BMI of 53 or less had a normal lymphocinogram, all patients with a BMI of 60 and above had lymphedema. So we recognize that an independent cause of lymphedema is extreme obesity. We also found uh, that super extreme obesity, BMIs with uh, uh, greater than 80 or even 100, you can actually get lymphedema in your upper extremity as well. So this is a patient that had a maximum BMI of 105. When we saw him in the clinic, it was 60. Uh, he had no flow to his inguinal nodes at 45 minutes, and um, he also had lymphedema of his upper extremities. So then several years later, we did uh, another uh, clinical study looking at 51 patients with um, obesity-induced lymphedema, and this is when we kind of named the, the, the condition obesity-induced lymphedema. We call it oil in our center, and what we found, again, was that there's some threshold between a BMI of 50 and a BMI of 60 where uh, for reasons we still don't understand, the uh, weight uh, damages your lymphatics uh, in your lower extremities. And then just uh, recently, uh, we did another uh, investigation of uh, almost 100 patients now. And what you can see here as the B patient's BMI increases, the black bar is their risk of uh, having lower extremity lymphedema based on lymphocentigraphy. It just keeps going up and up. And so we've never had a patient with a BMI less than 40 show lymphatic dysfunction on a lymphocinogram. And then it's almost universal once you, your BMI gets to be above 60. Another thing that we've uh, noted over the years is we were uh, referred patients uh, that had were non-ambulatory, had neuromuscular disease. And we looked back at eight uh, patients, we got lymphocinograms on all of them. And what we found was that the patients that had lymphatic dysfunction all had a BMI greater than 30. And here's just some examples. So here's a patient of 27, they were all referred with quote unquote lymphedema and swelling, uh, normal lymphatic function. Here's somebody, same thing, abnormal lymphatic dysfunction. And these are actually two brothers uh, that came from out of state. Uh, this brother's BMI is 22. They both have a myelomeningeal seal, no swe uh, swelling. His brother has a BMI of 42. They both have the same myelomeningeal seal. And here's his lymphocytogram showing delayed flow in popliteal nodes and dermal black flow. So the only thing different between these brothers is one is obese, one is not. And this patient has uh, lymphedema.
Another thing that uh, we found, and this has been uh, touched on during the symposium so, uh, so far, there's this thing called massive localized lymphedema that those of us in the field have seen. So here's a couple of examples. So uh, a few years ago, we did a case control study. And the bottom line with this study, we, we found that every patient that had massive localized lymphedema had underlying obese, obesity-induced lymphedema. So all these patients had uh, lymphedema. And then what happens is over time, the patients develop massive localized lymphedema. And so we found that if your BMI is over 56, you have a 213 times chance of getting uh, massive localized lymphedema. And then it actually follows this curve. So we actually have this laminated in our clinic. So if somebody comes in and they have a BMI of 70, we're able to predict that they have a 70 time, 70% a 70 risk of getting massive localized lymphedema. And this helps us, this figure helps us when we start counseling patients about weight management. If they haven't developed a massive, massive localized lymphedema yet, we show them this figure and uh, uh, implore them to try and lose weight before they end up getting this as well. So how do you diagnose obesity-induced lymphedema? The bottom line with this, it's pretty simple. It's their BMI and then a lymphocinogram. So again, based on the, our most recent study, if their BMI, if they've never had a maximum BMI greater than 40, we're confident to tell them they, they don't have lymphatic dysfunction. If their BMI is greater at 40, they are at increased risk. And as you've seen, as it gets, uh, their BMI gets higher, their risk goes up. The only way to tell definitively, though, is a lymphocinogram. They all have enlarged legs. They all have swelling. And here's just an example. So here's somebody with a BMI of 36. I wouldn't expect this patient to have oil because their BMI is not greater than 40. But you could see in this intermediate group here, the only way to tell is if you had, and they're all reverse, uh, they were all referred to me with lymphedema and swelling. So they all have lymphedema or, or all at least swelling. So here's somebody with the BMI of 45, normal lymphatic flow. Here's somebody with the BMI of 48, abnormal lymphatic flow. Here's somebody with a BMI of 54, normal. And then here's somebody with a BMI of 57, abnormal. So the definitive diagnosis is lymphocentigraphy. And as I kind of touched on with the question with the first uh, talk, you can see what happens, uh, what weight does. So these patients end up in this vicious circle. So here's someone that was relatively normal weight when they were 18. We always ask, what was your weight when you were 18? Uh, gained weight, this patient ended up with obesity. Uh, their BMI got to be greater than 40. They end up getting lymphedema. And then what happens is uh, once you get lymphedema, it uh, predisposes the, the disease, as we've talked about, causes fibroadipose deposition underneath the skin. So that causes more fat under the skin. And then the patient gains more weight, the patient's less able to exercise, and then, they're, then it's just damaging more lymphatics and you get in this vicious cycle. And then what happens is I uh, touched on is they end up getting oil and then you end up getting massive, massive localized lymphedema, they gain more weight, can't exercise, and it just everything just gets worse. So the only way to make this better is to break the cycle and have the patient lose weight. And so here's an example of a patient with a BMI of 80. She came in and was asking me to operate on her legs. Her primary complaint was the size of her legs. She wanted me to do liposuction or, or remove the fat on her legs. And so I explained to her that her fundamental issue was her weight, referred her to our bariatric surgical colleagues at Brigham Women's Hospital. Here's her lymphocinogram. Okay, nothing there at four, 45 minutes at two hours, um, uh, some faint flow. And look what happens to her legs. So she went to the center. They do a diet and exercise program, getting the question about a dietitian. Her BMI went down to 71, still has lymphedema, but look at her legs. Here she had a sleeve gastrectomy which is about a billion times less invasive than me trying to operate on her legs here. She would have a hundred percent complication rate. It would be life-threatening for me to try and do large excisional um, procedures on her legs with a BMI of 80, but she had a sleeve gastrectomy. Look at her BMI, look what's happening to her legs. Here she is with a BMI of 35. Uh, I could never have achieved this outcome with her legs trying to do a surgical procedure on her when she presented it with a BMI of 80. Interestingly, this was the first patient where we had um, prospective lymphocentigraphy data. And although her leg legs dramatically improved and she wasn't interested in me removing any extra skin, she was happy. You could see that she still has 
permanent lymphatic dysfunction and permanent lymphedema, although it's improved here on the two hour image. So here's another example of a patient. This patient's unique because he was only 20, came in early, and I showed him in our clinic, we have these, and Brett knows this, we have these uh, laminated in the clinic to help uh, show people what would happen when they lose weight. This patient came in, I showed him those other pictures. He lost, so here he is, BMI of 64. You could see his bilateral dermal uh, backflow. And he immediately lost weight on his own. He got it down to a BMI of 54. And look here, his, BM, his dermal backflow went away. So what we've learned from this patient is if you catch this early, it's potentially reversible. And the last patient, she had it so long, it wasn't reversible. So these are things I've learned. And this was another question I was asked. So here's a patient that had a maximum BMI of 55. She had a bariatric surgical procedure. She got her BMI down to 43. I wasn't, she wanted me to do liposuction on her legs. I wasn't enthusiastic about it because she still had a high BMI. I referred her back to the bariatric center and they refused to um, do anything else for her. They said they couldn't. So I was stuck at a BMI of 43. I wanted to help her. Here's her, you know, abnormal lymphocinogram. Here's the MRI showing the increased fat. Here's her leg. I always do one leg first and not uh, I don't do both legs the same because I don't think it's safe. And I like them to just have one good leg so they can ambulate and um, are uh, less risk for blood clots, et cetera. So here she is after one leg. Uh, here she is after both legs. I removed about six liters, which is a massive amount of adipose from both legs. And here you can see she certainly has an improvement, but it's not as dramatic as I would like. And um, Here's her post-op lymphocinogram showing improvement. She also uh, has a, a negative stemmer sign here. So getting to that theme that you want to operate on patients with oil or MML after, uh, MLL after they've lost weight. So here's another patient who came in with a BMI of 70. She really wanted me to remove this area of massive localized lymphedema. I counseled her that we have, she has to lose weight. It's very risky. Uh, and unsafe to try and remove this. Also, if I remove this, it'll, it would just come back if she didn't lose weight. So I sent her the bariatric surgical procedure, same theme, look what happened to her area of massive localized lymphedema after she had a sleeve gastrectomy. Her BMI is 30. She still has uh, lymphedema. Now it's much safer to remove this. So I simply removed this excess skin and I, it never came back and I wasn't concerned about coming back. But oftentimes patients want a quote unquote quick fix. So they want you to remove this. But when, and I show these pictures as well in the clinic, once you show them these uh, pictures, they better understand and they're more willing to uh, go to the uh, surgical weight loss center. Here's a couple examples. Again, what happens if you don't uh, have them lose weight first? Here's a patient with uh, obesity-induced lymphedema. His BMI was 65 when he presented with me. He um, had already had a bariatric surgical procedure. I sent him back. They wouldn't, weren't able to do anything. So here he has it of his scrotum. Uh, I removed, I think it was 80 pounds. Here he is afterward. And then, but his BMI is still, it was still above 60. So then here he is back in the office three years later with the area of massive localized lymphedema recurring. And unfortunately, there was no way to get his BMI lower because the bariatric surgeons were handcuffed. So here it is three years later. And then I ended up doing another resection. And then here's the same theme. This patient um, had oil. His maximum BMI was 110. Um, I ended up doing liposuction for him at the time his BMI was 60. He had an improvement, but his BMI was still 60. And so look what happened four years later, he's back in my office, um, with recurrence of the MLL. It's the same, or maybe even worse than before I did the liposuction at this stage, I ended up doing uh, a stage subcutaneous excision where I removed, I forgot how much this weighed, but I, I did a skin and excision. The problem is his BMI is still above 60. And here he is two years later after this very large risky procedure. Um, and here it is coming back again. And so ideally you always want the patient's BMI to be less than 40 or it will certainly come back. And in these situations, uh, the only way to help the patient is just to every several years do another excisional procedure.
So in conclusion, obesity-induced lipidemia is determined by the BMI, as I mentioned, uh, if their BMI, maximum BMI is less than 40, they're not at risk. And then as the BMI gets higher, their risk also increases. Once their BMI uh, gets to be over 56, they're at risk for massive localized lymphedema. As you've seen, the definitive diagnosis requires lymphocentigraphy. As you've seen, the uh, uh, treatment for oil is weight loss. And this is also a big public health problem. So one third of the United States population is obese. 6% actually have what's called super obesity, which is defined as a BMI over 40. And so 6% of the population is actually at risk for obesity induced lymphedema. And then after these patients lose weight, unlike their diabetes or hypertension, which are potentially curable with weight loss, as you've seen, the lymphedema is not. So it's much better to have patients and counsel patients with a BMI of approaching 40 to lose weight and not cross that threshold. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Dr. Green. Uh, so I'm gonna, just to, to save some time, kind of a summation of some comments in the chat and a question and with one I have myself. Often in, in clinic, there is that overlap of lipedema, obesity-induced lymphedema, Along with exam and some of the things Dr. Dean spoke about, how do you utilize nuclear lymphocentogram or, or not at all to differentiate those? Yes, I, I guess I agree with Dr. Dean. I, there's a lot of overlap between the three diagnoses. So I, in my opinion, I see them as three different things. And so I see lipedema is a lipodystrophy, as Dr. Dean talked about, uh, that affects females. So I think that's its own disease and a lipodystrophy. I think... Um, and so what happens is no matter whether you have lipedema or not, and we published this in that most recent cohort of 98 patients, we have patients with lipedema in there as well. So lipedema doesn't cause lymphatic dysfunction on its own. But what we showed in our research is that lipedema predisposes people to gaining weight and being obese, as Dr. Dean talked about. And so what happens is if you have lipedema, and a lot of these patients, they'll say they were pretty much normal weight when they're 18, their legs were out of proportion with their body, their mother had the same thing, then they're at risk for developing obesity, they get heavy. And then once their BMI gets to be over 40, and I think Dr. Dean had some data about in his clinic, then they end up getting obesity induced lymphedema on top of it. And so and then I think there's a third group of people who are referred to us that have quote unquote lymphedema and swelling, but their BMI uh, is between 30 and 40, let's say, or even between 40 and 50, and you have to get a lymphocinogram. And if, they're lymph if they don't have lymphatic dysfunction, we term those patients obesity without lymphedema or, or owl. So the way I see it, I'm kind of a splitter. I see you either have owl you have obesity without lymphedema based on your lymphocinogram, you have lipedema, which is a, a lipodystrophy, or you have obesity-induced lymphedema, but they're all related. Great. And then just, this is just a, a quick question. Is there a particular BMI cutoff where you feel um, decongestive therapy is not helpful, of no use at all? Or would you say, no matter what, give it Give it a try. So all these patients, I, I, there's no downside to the decongestive therapy. All these patients have compression garments, they have a pump. But what I explained to the patients is that um, all of these conservative man, uh, you know, measures are not going to help them unless they lose weight. And so you, sometimes patients get caught up on, okay, doing more uh, compression therapy, what have you, but we show them all these pictures and um, nothing will help them unless they lose weight. Great. Thanks so much, Dr. Green.